Okay, good afternoon. It being four o'clock, I'll call the... Are we rolling? We are. Okay. Meeting to order of the Committee on City Services and the Northampton City Council. Uh, Would you like calling the roll? Sure. Up? Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Lavard. Present. Present. Councilor Midwell. Here. And Councilor Nash. Here. Thank you. And I see no public here to offer public comment. So we'll move right along. Thank you for coming. Dwayne, to uh, Fire Chief Dwayne Nichols, who's giving an update on fire and EMS operations. Give up your hand up. That's great. Cool. We like hand up. Graphs and charts and. Just a general department update and kind of some status of a few things of hiring and stuff. But uh, what I'll cover first is just some stats from last year. Uh, I'm I'm happy in one way to say that we had the busiest year ever in 2018. Uh, total combined with EMS and fire, we did over 70 7,000 calls. Exactly, we did 7242, so 7,242 calls uh, between EMS and fire. Uh, that's the most we've ever done as a department. Um, last year, we just we were like eight calls shy of uh, 7,000. So this year, in 2018, we actually increased our call volume about 200 calls. Uh, and, and I kind of equate that. I think people are more quick to call 911 and ask for assistance than, than they were years ago. But what we're continually seeing every year is our, our call volume continues to increase uh, as, as we go forward out there. Um, Can I just open yeah. that? So um, I know it's broken down between EMS and fire. Yep. And we took over EMS 10 years ago? Uh, it was 2004 we started. Oh, 15 with a years ago. Yeah. Oh. 2004 we started with okay. a backup and we took over in 2008 uh, as full time. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. So still it's been a solid 10 years yep. as full time. Yep. So when you're seeing these increases, it's not just related to people being more likely to call EMS than. Fire. You're talking about the EMS volume has gone it, up over these. And, and I think it's, it's hard to kind of dictate. I, didn't, I looked at the numbers quick. You know, our, our fire volume seems to stay right around that 18,000 or 1,800, you know, 1,900 call volume, but it's the EMS side exactly that increases out there. Oh. That could, you, could you explain what ALS versus BLS because you are being videoed and it'd be yeah. nice that people know what you're uh, Absolutely. Uh, can, can I run through this first one? Yeah. I think you got yeah. the EMS one. He's yeah. This one yeah. 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 And uh, so just kind of down through here quick, uh, total mutual aid for the year, uh, we had given 141 times we went outside the city and that is actually for EMS and fire. And then uh, we received aid 18 times. Uh, which to me is a pretty significant number that says that we are right at the level of staffing we should be and, uh, and we're not calling in resources uh, from other communities uh, uh, because we're committed or tied up in other calls. So uh, that's a good number there. I do keep an eye on and uh, keep reviewing what we're going outside the city because that pull resources away from uh, our citizens and our people here. Uh, but 141 times that's EMS and fire. Uh, so. On fire, certainly the big thing in the fire service is uh, mutual aid with help when someone has a fire. Uh, we're all quick to call for help because you know, it's needed out there and uh, it's a necessary thing for us to kind of operate. Uh, uh, an interesting stat, the next one down is overlapping calls. So 51% of the time, what that reads is that I have multiple calls going on in the city. So uh, more than uh, half the times that we have, basically it could be two EMS calls, could be an EMS and a fire call, could be fire calls uh, we have that going on that, that's kind of an interesting stat that mm. shows our crews aren't uh, sitting idle they're pretty busy out there and moving around the city uh, and just the last two stats are kind of the response times uh, the first one is dispatch to arrival so when we're dispatched the time we get on scene uh, so our average for all calls is six minutes that's well within the uh, national standards out there 
so that means when someone calls 911, within six minutes, we'll have someone on scene. And that doesn't count the uh, police. Uh, police, most of the time, get there quicker because they're out in the in the city and uh, are able to get resources there quick. Uh, and I have to say that we have quite uh, an EMS system in the city that I'm quite proud of. That you don't see it too many too many communities out there. Uh, between fire and police, uh, we can probably get a first responder on scene in probably three to four minutes, and that may be a police officer to start first aid. And then we can get, you know, basically within <coughs> six minutes, get fire resources, uh, EMS and fire on scene. And for the major level calls, uh, heart attacks, difficulty breathing and things, everyone's aware that we send a fire engine with an ambulance uh, just because there's extra hands needed. Uh, and, and we're able to get those needed personnel on scene to be able to take care of people. So for a cardiac arrest, the way they teach it now is basically you need about uh, five to seven people to do a cardiac arrest mm -hmm. for one person just because of the amount of time you need to get uh, procedures and treatment started and to be able to move the patient and get them you know expeditiously to the hospital uh, those are the numbers and we're meeting that really really well uh, and there isn't too many communities that can boast that you know we can on a, on a fire on a heart, heart attack call basically we can get six to seven responders there very quickly to render aid yes sir um, one of the other things that is so uh, impressive about this response time is that uh, I recently went to a, one of the Hampshire Hope Narcan trainees. Yeah. And the response time is so excellent that they, with confidence, can feel they can administer a first Narcan mm -hmm. or someone on the site can, whether it's a yeah. restaurant owner or someone else, with great confidence know that by the time there might be a second Narcan needing to be administered, yeah. EMS is going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're doing really well. I mean, unfortunately, we still had, I know it was a week and a half ago, we had three overdoses, uh, it was a Saturday in, in one time, but it's kind of, you know, that seems like the drugs come up in here and, and there's a bad batch and we'll get a number of overdoses. And I think out of that one, we had one one person uh, didn't make it, uh, but the other two we were able to revive and bring it back. So it's kind of neat. I, I'm pretty proud of what we have here. And uh, that not, not for me, but I think my predecessors mm -hmm. and, Please and fire who built this system up and out. So if you can recall, Chief, I think Council and you were involved with us in um, the committee on fire and safety when we had difficulties of the response time mm -hmm. and you were working under Chief Brian Duggan at that time yeah. of the concerns. And right away, you all got together and really looked at that very carefully about saving people's lives. So this is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, I'm very conscious of the response time because it's basically, you know, to get responders on scene quickly. That's what's going to save people. And that's the, the important thing for us. Uh, you know, strategically between Florence Station and, and downtowns, we seem to have that right mix uh, and getting people quickly to the scene. And again, I, I have to include police uh, They on the streets we work seamlessly together uh, but it's pretty cool that you know we can get you know whether it's a police officer or a firefighter on scene quickly to at least study and, uh, and get people going from there mm -hmm. and you're correct about sometimes having six to seven people because when a call went in on west Staten road mm -hmm. for cardiac and i got a call from a wife and went into the home and i knew then that there was a big problem yeah. when I saw them really working seriously on her husband. Mm -hmm. And the respect, I have to say, from the fire department is when they asked me if I would keep her in another room because you were bringing him out when he was already gone. Yeah, I, I have to say for, I, I've got a great group of people down there, uh, very professional, very good at what they do. Uh, I've got some medics that do some amazing things. Exactly. And it's pretty neat to see. And uh, I'm pretty proud of being, being their chief and, and leading them with that. And but when you see it with your own eyes, yeah, you can be proud of it and tell people what you actually yeah. see, what our fire department does. Yeah, yeah. We, we're good. I mean, we, we hold that professionalism and, and integrity up high. And uh, it's really cool to see that it's filtered right down to the junior guy. And, uh, you know, we pride ourselves on that. And, and that, that starts at the top. That kind of starts with the whole department as a whole. So it's kind of neat to see, and I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, so if we go over to the next page on that there, it's just kind of a quick breakdown of calls. Uh, last year we had 56 fires. Uh, 
Now, 56 fires range from anywhere. It could be a pot on the stove that caught a captain on fire to certainly a, a total fully involved house. So that's the number there. Uh, the good thing is, is I've been in the department 32 years and I continue to see that number drop. So I, I think fire prevention wise uh, and just education wise, we're doing our job up there of trying to uh, educate the people on how to protect themselves and take care of themselves. Uh, unfortunately, I would say that we still have homes in the city that don't have smoke detectors. Uh, I'll cover it a little bit later. I know we had the fire on Carolyn Street uh, up in Florence and, and we lost uh, the gentleman there uh, with that fire, but he didn't have any working smoke detectors. Uh, and I know the building commissioner, Louis Hollybrooks and myself, have been really talking about, can we somehow get detectors in the city that you know his inspectors carry and, and my fire engines carry that if someone we find them with no smoke detectors that we could you know give it to them uh, because that's the big thing is that's what saves lives is really smoke detectors out there you're still doing that yeah. if i have a resident who needs one because yeah. i know before with the chief i told him i had a resident yeah. who needed one and they went in there and he didn't want them but they did put them in yeah yeah if, if you have someone just please let us know Okay. Uh, and, and you know, as long as they're willing to let us put them up, uh, we're we're looking to basically get out and do that because that's that's the biggest thing that you know, how we're going to help people. Um, just just quick, quick. Do, yeah. Does the does the 56 fires include fires outside Northampton? No, nope. that sure that's just nope. within the just, city. Just within city. Okay. Yep. Yep. And uh, so it's a wide range in through there. It's just how we categorize it because all the fire data is really on a national database, and uh, so it kind of categorizes even that small fire. Uh, that's quickly put out versus uh, certainly a fully involved we categorize it as a as a fire uh, and just kind of the other ones I won't run through that you guys can look at that later on uh, and just kind of gives you kind of an indication of what we do there was three four other pages there I didn't think you guys want to be inundated with every every column that we had so I just gave you the highlights out through there what, what is a good intent call I was just uh, a, good, a good intent is kind of where somebody calls and, and they're concerned about something and it turns out to be nothing so it could be someone calling and, and basically saying, you know, uh, you know, my smoke detector's chirping, and uh, we know it's uh, it's probably a battery problem. Uh, so they called, we're looking for assistance, and, and it really was nothing happening in there. It just we helped them replace the battery, and we categorize as kind of a good intent. Okay, and, and down through there. Chief, yeah. On the false alarm and false calls, yeah. I know that we had difficulties like with McDonald's House or Los mm -hmm. Salvos with mm -hmm. alarms going off. Yeah. Is that still the same with an increase on that? Those uh, we've worked over the years with getting new alarm systems in there. I know the Salvo House, I think actually Laura broke yeah, that. Yeah, I want to say it was 2002 yeah. we replaced the fire alarm. We the fire alarm in Salvo. Uh, since then, we were, I know the latest one was Fruit Street. We replaced that probably. It's probably been like eight years by now. Uh, and I think four Sander and Florence we replaced. So they've kind of upgraded the systems to, to help eliminate those type of calls uh, out through there. Uh, we do monitor basically false alarms. One of my deputies does every month do kind of a false alarm report for me to see where things are. Because uh, there is a city ordinance that we can charge people. Uh, but I'm fortunate to say that I haven't had to bill anybody for two years. Oh, uh, so they've been pretty responsive and identified with that. Uh, but the housing authority uh, has been really responsive. I know a couple times we've had numerous alarms down there. I'm able to call the director and they seem to get right on, on it. Because it's usually toasters. A, a lot is, and with the, with the upgraded systems, uh, it, it kind of eliminates that. So we get localized detection within the unit, but it doesn't set out the whole building, uh, and which is good because we don't get everyone becomes mm -hmm. complacent with that. Uh, so we, we've done a lot of work with that and, uh, oh, and really helped that up and out. Thank you. Uh, on the next one for EMS, and this this is kind of just I, I would say these are like the, the neat charts to look at. Uh, now ALS versus BLS. ALS is advanced life support, and BLS is basic life support. So it's the difference between a, it, ALS is a paramedic uh, rendering care and uh, BLS. So we categorize that by the treatments uh, that they do and in the interventions. Uh, because right now I'm happy to say it's I think. Uh, about 80% of the times we have double, we could say double paramedic ambulances. So you have two paramedics showing up. Uh, by state and our, our license with the state, we can work a, a basic with a paramedic, but just with the staffing I have for paramedics, we're able to put two paramedics out there, which 
uh, certainly I think enhances the, the ability of the two, two individuals to basically work something out. Uh, so that's the difference there. And that's always held pretty steady that it's really like a 50-50 split that uh, it, it really boils down to kind of you know, what, what type of call and what interventions we need to do. Uh, and that's just kind of a neat thing. And uh, so if we go over to the next page, it just gives us some scene time uh, that we're out through there. And I think actually, actually on page three, it's kind of the breakdown by month. Uh, the busiest month we had I was basically October, so about 236 EMS calls out through there. Uh, what month was that? Actually, October. We had 236. Uh, it would be ALS calls and then you had EMS calls. Uh, so it's kind of the spike. And the cool thing with that is, is it's really across the board. There isn't much of a variance there. So we're pretty steady. We don't see that rise because of colleges coming back in or anything like that. It's a pretty steady number coming across. And on the following page after that is kind of the incident count. And that's really kind of the uh, basically time of the day. I know Councillor Murphy always like to see what was the, the time of the day or busiest. Uh, it looks like right about noontime uh, is really our busiest time. And, uh, and if you look, I think the page after, there's uh, actually two Noon pages. Noontime, why specifically? Uh, it's hard to dictate. It's, it's hard to look at the numbers. Kind of one o'clock. Here's noon. Here, here's one o'clock. Huh. And the and the busiest day uh, is actually Thursday, and uh, it's very it's very close. If you look at the Tuesday, uh, Tuesday is pretty close, but for whatever reason, the data kind of shows that that's the busiest day that we have up there. Uh, and just some some interesting kind of data on how how our call volume comes in. I won't cover everything there. If anybody has any questions on that, I can certainly answer them. Well, yes, sir. Um, so in terms of this chart, I'm just curious as to, you know, why there's more incidents during the day. I mean, it makes sense. People are awake and stuff right. happens and then they fall and they get hurt. I, I think it's, it's a lot of that. Uh, it's basically people that are awake and orientated and uh, are more inclined to call. I know, I know my father, uh, he, he had a problem a year ago, and uh, he waited till morning to call me, and uh, he, he, it happened overnight, and I was like, Dad, just call 911, and uh, right. you know, I, and I think it's a little bit of that, but I think people, you know, they get up in the morning and think they're going to feel better, and I think by noontime, if they're not starting to feel better, I, I think the inclination right. is, well, I better go see somebody and, and hmm. seek out help. There's um, not a huge difference, though, really, between nine in the morning and nine at night yeah ten at eleven at night nine in the morning eleven they're all kind of in the same it's really you're not going to get people it's really the only dip is the four in the morning time yeah well it's just curious One, to two, me in two, terms of like you you think humans think that, would be have emergencies going on all the yeah. time and it would be level but no there's actually two, different three, parts four, of the day are, two three four and five are really slow yeah I wonder why yeah. that is. I don't know. And, and That's actually two, three, four, five, and six. So I guess people are sleeping through their emergency. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's a lot of it. Is, uh, well, that's kind of that's if you have a heart condition and you're sleeping, you're probably not stressing your heart out. It's when you get up and you're trying to get through your work day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and this data has held true for for a number of years. I, right. I know we tracked it forever. And uh, it seemed to be that way, that we used to have the impact shift, we call it. It was 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, that was to hit the, the peak volume that we had. Mm -hmm. So it was to kind of mirror that. Yeah. Uh, but as we kind of grew, we kind of grew out of that shift. And uh, what we did is basically put the personnel on 24s. And because uh, we used to just run two ambulances overnight, and now we run three. So it, it kind of spreads the workload out amongst the shifts a, a little bit better. Yeah. And, uh, and our pe people are, aren't beat up as much. Uh, right. going out and some people fall asleep and don't wake up who've had health problems. Yes, yeah. And they're not found until morning and things right. like that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Well, th thank you, Chief. Very, very helpful overview. It certainly gives you a picture of an apartment that's well staffed. The response times are, are, are really, really impressive. Um, a month ago, Chief Castro was in here, mm -hmm. and we were talking with her about retention issues, retention of, of staff and recruitment, yeah. and some of the challenges she was facing. Just curious what, what you see when it comes to retaining your staff and when you need to go out and search um, what the recruitment process is like. Are you getting the candidates you would like? Yeah. Fortunately, I have to say, I haven't lost anybody in two years to another department. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think with the last collective bargaining agreement we did, uh, we put our compensation package right, I think, right in the middle. We're not high on, in the end for Western Mass, but we're right in the middle. And uh, people enjoy working for us. And you don't have something like the state police. Exactly. Which That's is the big magnet for, right. for right. our people. I mean, there isn't a similar... So, you <coughs> see, so retention, we, we've done very well at keeping people. Uh, and like I say, I'm, I know the mayor in the last uh, union contract that they signed, I think, did very well in, in kind of solidifying that. Uh, and hiring people, uh, actually, I just interviewed this morning for uh, firefighter, paramedic, and uh, we were, we're in the process of hiring three. Uh, I had three retirements in January, uh, and those are to fill those three positions. Uh, I know we had a pretty good pool of that, uh, but paramedics are really kind of hard to come by. Uh, it's really, nowadays, uh, so many departments are hiring them, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the pool is pretty small. And then for, for kids going into paramedicine, they're actually going beyond paramedics and uh, becoming PAs. Because uh, if you look at the, uh, the college educations and stuff, really for just a little bit more uh, of a cost, you can actually come out as a physician assistant. And mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot more people yeah. doing that and saying, well, exactly. it's, uh, the hours are better, the pay is a little bit better, mm -hmm. uh, and they're going that way. Uh, we, we've been fortunate uh, that when we've uh, advertised and hired, we're able to find good candidates. Uh, I got three people that we moved forward this morning that are excellent. Uh, excellent people, excellent paramedics, and should be excellent firefighters for us. Uh, so I, I haven't seen that. I, I talk to Chief Casper every now and then, and I know her concerns over at the police department. Uh, but retention, we've done very well, and I think at some point we, we may be, we may see a point where we, we struggle to hire paramedics. Uh, I, and we're probably a few years out from that, uh, because right now the civil service list, uh, a lot of departments are still under civil service. Uh, they just came out with a new list in December, and I know a lot of departments and talking to chiefs held off on hiring until that new list came out. So that list will get depleted pretty quick, and, uh, and just a pool goes down. And a paramedic program is about two and a half years, so you, you get that new cycle of students coming out about every two years. Uh, we actually lost the paramedic program in the area. Springfield College shut down their program. Oh, did they? Uh, yep. So the only one running a, really, there's two programs in Western Mass right now. Uh, Greenfield Community College is running one, uh, and that's a very good program up there. And then uh, AMR, American Medical Services in Springfield, uh, the private ambulance company down there runs a, a paramedic program out of Springfield too. How come they closed it down? Uh, I don't know what the, the reasons were, if it was uh, enrollment or what, what the problems were. Uh, with that, and I know the person, uh, the couple of people that were really involved in running the program, I think, had retired. So I don't know if they just felt that they weren't going to continue it on, or they couldn't find the right people to kind of pick it up and continue on with that. But it was kind of neat having at least like three programs because you kind of can stagger kind of some people coming out of it. Uh, but right now it's down to two. And uh, one of the huge things we have with Greenfield is a mentor program. So. People coming through their paramedic program coming down and do ride time with us. Uh, so as a paramedic, you have to do some field uh, time out there and be able to do some procedures. And uh, we've done very well of actually kind of recruiting off of that uh, when they come down and do ride time with us. So uh, it's been a great thing for us. And, and actually, our guys, I got a lot of guys that love teaching. Uh, so it's been a very positive morale thing in the department to bring some students in. I could see where there would be a problem just trying to find somebody versus somebody just strictly going in to be a physician's assistant. Mm -hmm. They make good money. Yeah, 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 and, and that's, you know, we've heard that, I've, I've asked around a lot, and, and, you know, and talked to people about it, and that's what we're seeing is a lot of the, these young kids coming in that years ago would have went, you know, to be a paramedic, 
Uh, but now they found that, well, if I continue on a little bit more, I can, can you know, get a better education and I can certainly make, um, they make good bucks. some good money. At, uh -huh. uh, and I hear a lot of times- They'd have to really want to be a firefighter. Yeah, a, and, and that's a huge yeah. thing too, yeah. is, is we've had, uh, we've interviewed a lot of people and then it came right down to, it's only a handful, but we've had a few back out that said, you know, I don't really want to be a firefighter. I like, mm -hmm. I like doing paramedicine, yep. but I, I mean, I want to be a firefighter. Uh, and we've lost a couple of people uh, about two years ago with that. They, they kind of, we hired them, got them started with the training, and then they said, and, and I applaud them for that. They I came up quickly and said, you know, firefighting's not for me. You know, we should be running into burning buildings. That's not what people should be doing, so. Uh, but it is, firefighting and, and being a paramedic is certainly a unique thing for mm -hmm. people. You gotta want yeah, it. Is. Yeah. The three that are retiring, mm -hmm. how many years? Uh, basically, I, I had Ray Langlois, John Betzel, and Andy Marini, and I think Andy Marini had 25 years, John wow. Betzel had 27, and Ray Langlois had 33. Wow. <clears throat> I have all people should know this, but is the fire department still under civil service? No, nope, we got out of civil service. <laughs> it's probably because I was there. Yep, in 2004. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You don't have it. Nope. So much yes. nope. No, that's actually been a great time. Yeah, I do remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we've done very well at keeping people, and I'm uh, very proud of that. And uh, and so far, we've had good luck of being able to hire people. We never hear anything. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, I mean, I think that's good there. Uh, our shift strength is, is a minimum of 13. Uh, right now, depending if I'm a full staff, I have two shifts at 16 and two shifts at 15. Uh, but I have three vacancies right now, so they're a little bit low once we get those new people on shift. What shifts are 15 and 16? It it's, depends on personnel, because uh, we've always got people that are going to the fire academy and things. Uh, so it depends on kind of just staffing, and we use, usually use those two lot of people. It kind of floats that okay. will cover vacancies. One of, one of the big challenges uh, for us is uh, you know, leave, family medical leave, uh, and emergency leave and things like that of, of people going out. That, that's a big, uh, a big hit that if someone has to take time off for their family and stuff like that, it does leave a vacancy in the department that we have to probably backfill uh, to go. And it's always a challenge for us to, to keep that going. Dana Charette, is he still helping you out? D Dana is actually the hearing officer for yeah, the city. That's yep. oh, nice. yep. I was wondering if he was still doing yep, that. Yeah, he's still doing that, yep. Yeah, it's good to see. He comes into the apartment, he usually a couple times a month. I know. And uh, it's awesome to see him, so. He's my neighbor. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of where, where we are. Uh, and, and for challenges and stuff for the department, I, I think, you know, right now I can't say that we really have any. I think it's trying to stay ahead of the curve uh, as far as what's new out there. Uh, you know, we, we certainly had Ebola uh, and, and those type of things that come out and we seem to be really good at coming up with how to deal with them and then moving on and, uh, and, and that's really good but those are the challenges that are, that are happening out there. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we see that I don't think will be a big impact is we now fall under OSHA as of February 1st. Right. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the department just to see where we stand uh, and what we need to do and we've had to filter a lot of it out because we had less than a year kind of prepare for it but uh, as a department, I think we're in really good shape. Uh, looking at our policies, we're, we're right on with those, uh, and it's just really more record keeping for us to just you know, make sure we're fit testing people, people that are you know, getting intake physicals, and it's all stuff that we've been doing, which is cool to see. Uh, it's just kind of gathering it up so that we can put our hands on it if, if someone ever wanted to see that. Uh, Facility-wise, uh, work with data comrades and central services, I think we're really in solid shape with that uh, for OSHA. So. Uh, I know a lot of smaller departments have real concerns about that, but we're in excellent shape. Uh, you know, the big thing is, is exhaust systems in the apparatus bays, but we've had those for years, and uh, so we're, we're covered there. And, uh, and fortunately, there's no big expense because of this new OSHA standard that we have to live up to. So everything is okay as far as maintenance-wise inside yeah. the building itself? Yeah, as, as, as David Pomerantz has been great as far as building maintenance and things like that. Uh, just to update you on the budget, uh, we're, we're doing really well with our fire budget. The, the one uh, line item this year that's been hit kind of hard is our vehicle repair maintenance. I was just going to ask you that. It's, uh, 
we, we, as you guys know, uh, if you remember, I had a capital request for 60000 for our ladder truck to go to Florida to basically have a, a whole new electrical system put into that. Uh, but that happened, and when they were down there, uh, we didn't anticipate some overruns uh, with some repairs. So that was about $6,000 with extra stuff that needed to be done with that. Uh, on the good side is, is when we did that, we probably added another 10 to 12 years on the life of the truck. So uh, it, instead of a new replacement truck right now would be about 1.4 million. So we, we spent 60,000, actually 66,000, and, and we added an extended life of the vehicle. Uh, so on a fire truck? On our, on our ladder truck, yeah. Ladder truck. yeah. Wow. So that, that's kind of cool. I was pretty happy. Uh, I, I told the mayor, I said, I'm pretty pretty proud that we, we researched it and we found the company that was going to do it and we got it done uh, because they had to go to Florida. So that was a unique thing. Of they actually drove it down uh, and drove it back. Uh, but it's been flawless. Uh, we've actually had it at the Carolyn Street Fire and we had no problems with it. And uh, the guy's been training on it, and we've actually had no no issues. So what year is that truck? It's a 2004. So that that should be good. I'm predicting out to about 2030, 2032 wow. in that range. Um, so we we've done very good. Uh, we got an in-house mechanic who was meticulous, and uh, he's really really up on preventive maintenance. And has he been there for a long time? Hasn't he? Uh, we actually we transitioned. Dan Luthier had yeah. resigned. Uh, and now we have uh, a new man in there, Jeff Bates, uh, who's been there about 18 months, and he's been fabulous. That helped. And uh, so then we have a couple other things. We unfortunately had a couple of accidents this winter uh, with some ambulances and fire engines that uh, it cost the department some money. And probably the bigger thing is we had our engine one, which is a 2013 engine. Uh, we actually. It, around the uh, windshield and around some windows, we had some bubbling of paint, and uh, it was a body defect. And unfortunately, it was only a 50% warranty on it uh, because of this five years old, and uh, we just missed. I think they gave a four-year warranty on it. Uh, so uh, we sent it down to uh, Greenwood, uh, which is in Attleboro, and uh, on its way down there, so we knew that there was going to be a $6,000 expense to the department, which I felt we could absorb with our maintenance. Uh, on its way back, it blew its turbo, uh, so that's probably about is about thirty five hundred dollars for a new turbo, uh, and we're getting that repaired there. So we've had a couple out of the norm repairs, big repairs out there that have happened. So, uh, but I feel confident in working with the mayor and Susan Wright on just keeping an eye on it. And my my hope is that I don't have to come in to transfer any money. Uh, and hopefully, we can keep it contained within our operating budget. So thank you for that update. Very good. I, I just one other kind of unrelated question. Yep. Uh, a week or so ago, I was at a community meeting up on Village Hill. Residents wanted to just kind of get together and talk about the, the murder suicide up there. Yeah. We'll talk about it. For some folks in the building was a rather dramatic experience. Yep. And the question came up. Well, it was tough for us. Imagine what it was like for the first responders arriving on the scene. Um, yes. Which raised for me the question. Um, what you don't see this as often as police officers, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, there are rather gruesome and horrible situations yep. you encounter. What is the incidence of PTSD like issues, and what, what are the, the resources available for, for help? So, so we, we have through AP some long term stuff that we can send people to, uh, like for, for that call up there. Uh, we, we have a, a chaplain on the department, uh, Bruce Arbor has been with us for quite a number of years, uh, and he's trained in all that. So I know the, the responders that went up to that call, uh, they certainly were a little bit shaken back. Uh, so we have Bruce as a resource that we brought him right in immediately. Uh, so what we'll do is, is we'll bring him in, Bruce will talk to the people, you know, we'll basically, if we take him off shift for a little bit, just to kind of you know, debrief, we say it. Uh, so that's kind of our first line of it. Uh, and then Bruce has resources within the Chaplain's Association of Massachusetts where he belongs to of doing longer term. Uh, but we've been very fortunate that, you know, having Bruce there quick, talking to our responders, it, it really has done a great job of, you know, kind of eliminating a lot of stress and, and a lot of potential there. Uh, and he works, Bruce will work confidential with the individual if they want some more counseling and stuff like that. So he's been a phenomenal resource for us out through there. Uh, and you know, within the department, I don't know if anybody is aware, we had one of our members' wife's pass away 
Uh, she was 33 year old, 33 years old when she passed. They had a 10 month old son at the time. Uh, it kind of really rocked the department, and she passed away on Christmas Day. Uh, so that was one of those things that really just kind of shook the department. Uh, Bruce was great uh, to come in, and I've never seen the department pull together uh, as a unit in, in all my years there. And it was phenomenal to see, to support this individual and this family out there. Uh, just a tragic situation, uh, but you know we, we've had Bruce in quite a bit, I say too often, to come in and kind of work with people and just kind of talk to them. And that's really what a lot of people need sometimes is just, just to kind of talk about it and, and really kind of just express their feelings and get them out. Uh, but Bruce has been very good with that. And he has resources outside where we can bring in full teams of people if necessary uh, to be able to you know, counsel them and, and coach them. Uh, fortunately, we haven't really seen any problems with PTSD in the department with firefighters. Uh, we really try to be proactive. Uh, and that's what I push down to my officers. Uh, if you think we need to get somebody off shift and get them to talk to somebody, let's do it. Uh, let's not wait uh, and, and you know, basically try to deal with it later on is to try to get that immediate you know, help to them and, and try to take care of them. Uh, because that's a big part of what I feel is we need to take care of our people. And, uh, and part of that's you know, their mind and body and soul and uh, you know, get them the resources that they need to be able to make them you know, basically whole again so they can do their work. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so we had uh, we had uh, certainly that situation with our firefighter and his wife. Uh, we, we had that call up there, which was pretty dramatic for the two responders uh, that responded up there. Uh, we, we've had a couple other bad calls in the city that uh, where we pulled Bruce into, and then we had the death on Carolyn Street, uh, where you know we brought Bruce in just to talk to the shift afterwards on that one there. Um, so he, he's been there, he, he's a great resource, but unfortunately I, I hate calling him because it means something's probably not so good happened out there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. No, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you for all your work. Oh, thank, thank you. you. All your thank staff. You. And, uh, and just, just on fires, we had Carolyn Street, uh, basically that ended up being Carol's disposal uh, of smoking material uh, once we found it the investigation on that. Uh, we've had a two, two small fires recently that kind of ho hopefully were nothing. We had one on Finn Street, uh, 22 Finn Street. There was a porch fire, but it ended up being an occupant basically uh, had put some uh, material in a wastebasket, put it on the front porch that ignited. Uh, so fortunately it was nothing. And then we had the old nursing home uh, up on Bridge Road mm -hmm. where it was kids breaking into that and uh, starting fires. So uh, the police department's been great. We have a great team of people doing uh, investigations and we were able to identify that. Uh, I know Lou Hasbrook and I, uh, basically you may see something come forward that we're asking that the nursing home be boarded up. Uh, it's pretty open, there's people going in and out of there. We believe the homeless are living there. Uh, and we're trying to get the owners to secure it, but I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to. Because uh, I know on Carolyn Street, I think you guys were presented with an order to Board it up, mm -hmm. yes. pay for it, right. to, to demolish. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and for the nursing home up there, we're looking to do that just to keep people out because mm -hmm. something something bad's gonna happen if we don't. I know it looks awful. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised that piece of property hasn't moved. I'm not uh, but uh, but just to give you a quick update there, that uh, we're looking at that as a as a public safety hazard because when we had the fire up there, it was you, you just after that last snow, and you want to see the footprints around. <coughs> in all the time wow. and uh, so we need to secure it to uh, there's a standard out there that secure us so that nobody can get in there right. uh, and, and Lou's been the front point on that working with the, right. uh, the uh, owner of the company right now hopefully he'll pay for that uh, and it doesn't come back to the city Did but they say why it's not selling I don't, I don't know I, I know I've talked to Lou about that he doesn't have any uh, inclination of why and has how moved. long has it been up for sale it's, I don't see a sign out there anymore yeah, we, we were probably thinking it's been closed for a good eight years, maybe right. 10. So, uh, but I mean, it's basically, the, you know, kids were playing in there and, and people are doing drugs in there and stuff like that. And we just don't want to see anybody get hurt. Uh, it needs to be secured. So just FYI, if mm -hmm. you see that order come through, uh, that's kind of the concern yeah. that we push for. I know the police department, talking to Jody, they, they're up there all the time for right. people going in and out, so. Huh. That'd be a nice place for a shelter. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, I always I always thought that like one of these doctors' offices or, or medical mm -hmm. facilities would have purchased it, but 
All right. Are there any other questions? I, I just want to say thank you. This was very informative. Oh, yeah. Um, it, I, I, I don't have any questions. So that was a very thorough report. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if, if anybody ever has questions, please reach out. Uh, I, I, I'm using my office, so I'm mm -hmm. trying to provide you as much information as I can. Thank you. Uh, but, okay. uh, but we're a resource there, so. Careful what you say about reputation for coming back with more questions. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's, it, it keeps me Susan on my toes. Right knows that. <laughs> well, thank you again yeah, for the whole awesome. committee, and we appreciate you taking this time out of your thank busy you. day. Thank Come you. back anytime. <laughs> it's, it's always nice to give kind of a, a positive yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Update. Side, so. No, it was good to hear about the trucks. Very good. Yes. The fire trucks and so forth. Yeah, I mean, we, we've done a good job. I think we have a good fleet. We just ran into a couple bigger, costly items that we need Happens. to repair out there. Uh, like I say, I'm, I'm hoping, my hope is, is uh, I, I think Mary Ann will probably laugh at me a little bit. When she seemed to was retired, uh, I'll never forget the last presentation he did for his budget was, in all his years as chief, he had never gone over his budget. And, and I always had hope that I could say that when I retire. But, uh, we'll, see, we'll, see, uh, we'll see what happens with that. So, but things are out of my control in that, that manner. So 1.4 million for a new ladder. Yeah, yeah. It was one of those that I, I looked at for the capital plan, and it, it, was, it was a thought in my head for a couple of years. And it was challenging to find, because it had to be done by the manufacturer uh, who makes the truck, which is E1's the brand. Uh, so I actually started a conversation with a company in Ocala, Florida, or yeah, in Ocala, Florida, and ended up talking to engineers down there. Uh, they actually had somebody fly up here to look at the truck because it's a 2004, and they're like, "Well, we're not going to say we can do anything for you if the truck is, you know, basically, you know, falling apart and, and it's not worth putting the money into." So they flew someone up to take a look at it. They came back and said, "Well, this truck is in really, really good shape." Hmm. And uh, and then we started from that process of what can we do for it, and you know we identified the problems we've been having with it, and as they call it, a multiplex system in the truck, which is basically the electrical system where everything runs off of. Uh, and this was a first generation one, and the in talking to the engineers, uh, they basically were like, yes, those are inherent for problems, and so they went to the drawing board and tried to configure out with the existing truck could they put a, a newer multiplex system in there and what would be the cost. And they, they kind of came up with that whole figure and then we had to figure some transportation in and we, we came up with roughly about $60,000 with that. Uh, and as I said to the mayor, I said, my, my hope is is I, I don't come to you uh, in a few years and say I need a new ladder truck for 1.4 is that we can spend 60 now and hopefully mm -hmm. extend the truck, uh, the life of it for a while longer. Save the money. And, uh, which, which we did, uh, so that's, that's a positive. Congratulations. Thing. So yes. it, it was I was good with that. I actually had another capital one that we, we just found the other day. Uh, we were looking to get a new air compressor uh, to fill our air bottles that we use. And we've been having problems with it. And I, I put it out that the company that's been servicing it uh, has said, well, you, you've got like five years. So I put it in a couple years ago and had kept it moving forward. And uh, so we found a new company that basically repairs it. Well, what I found is the old company, and, and shame on us kind of per se, doesn't really work on that brand, uh, so that they were telling me basically, oh yeah, we, we can't, you can't repair that. You could be obsolete. You need to get repairs on that. Mm -hmm. So I found this new company that came in, and, and uh, the technician was great, and uh, the company was excellent. They're like, there's nothing wrong with this. You need to for five thousand dollars, you need to replace the the controller, and uh, we'll update that for you. And they said that should run for another twenty years. So I was, I was happy to go back to Susan Wright, I, and I said, like. Well, one, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that I, I've been pushing this forward, but I'm happy to say that now that after some research and looking for different people, I'm able to say, let's take that 75 off the capital plan uh, and, and take it right off. Uh, and within my budget, I should be able to, by year's end, just replace that control valve on it. And uh, we'll basically, as the guy said, those air compressors will run forever. So it's yeah, still, still learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Well, folks, is there a motion to approve the minutes of January uh, 7th and January 17th? Move to approve the minutes of those two meetings. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 
and no abstentions or opposition, that carries. And then we just have the two items that came to us, which are the, and you don't feel like you need to stay for the oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> We just have a couple of appointments to take okay. care of where we live. So thanks again, I appreciate thanks, it. Thank, thank you. So we have the two that were referred to us on January 17th, and those were uh, Freeman Stein and Pauline Fogel, and uh, Council on the Barge spoke yeah. with uh, um, Stein? I talked to him. Um, Freeman Stein and had a very good talk with him and um, very interesting. But anyways, I had him email after we talked and he, this is what he has stated to me, that since he retired in November of 2013, he had explored ways to contribute to the quality of life of our wonderful city. And I loved that language. I, I just thought it was very valuable. He says, my appreciation for those who have worked to maintain and improve the quality of life for all of us through the work they have done for this city is deep. Based upon his experience working with artists, funding sources, and related institutions, and upon and by respect for the role the arts play and enhancing our lives. It would be a privilege and a joy for him to contribute to the work of the Arts Council. In addition to working with council members to sustain the activities already supported and coordinated by the council. He says he looks forward to helping in areas where there may be a need. Professionally, he has spent years working on committees, supervising and coaching others, facilitating committee work, assessing projects, and writing reports, grant writing, and program evaluation. He knows how to work collaboratively as well as independently. And he also has no shortage of ideas for how many or any committee I, he has ever worked on can continue to work effectively. Recently, he has considered new projects the Arts Council might explore. He thought about ways to bring to the arts to all neighborhoods of the city. For example, as a resident of Florence who lives on a dead-end street that overlooks the bike path. He said that he had been thinking about possibilities for using areas along the path for a, a variety of artistic projects from community landscaping projects to installations to many performances, providing opportunities for folks to interact with the arts in the small neighborhood venues might complement the larger whole community arts council sponsored events like the Silver Cove Bowl, Bowl and First Night. So he is saying he thanks us for considering his nomination and please don't hesitate to contact him if he has any questions. So I would like to make a motion um, for a full recommendation to City Council for Freeman Stein and the Arts Council. Sorry. Moved and seconded to send Freeman Stein with a positive recommendation to the full council for appointment to the Arts Council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed or abstentions. That one carries. And then Councilor? Uh, yes, I had a chance to speak with Colleen Fogel. She currently sits on the Historical Commission, and she would become, with this appointment, uh, the new appointee from the Historical Commission to Central Business Architecture Committee. Um, she is willing to take on both assignments, looks forward to it. She has um, been a tremendously uh, valuable member of the Historical Commission, and she looks forward to bringing her experience as, in part as a realtor to the architecture, or the downtown architecture committee. She thinks it's important, uh, along with the views of architects who serve on that committee and downtown uh, property owners and business owners, to also have the perspective of someone who lives in the neighborhood, uh, but that has the perspective of the way the real estate market is really working. So. I think she'd be a, a good addition to uh, the Architecture Committee. I'm glad she's willing to step up and serve. So I would uh, make a motion to send a positive recommendation, Pauline Fogel, 
to the council. Second. I second. Okay, moved and seconded. Second. First and Pauline <laughs> uh, Vogel with a positive recommendation to the city council for appointment as the historical commission representative on the central business architecture. Yes. Um, now, one question I have about these appointments before, before we vote on it. Just as, I mean, I assume that when they are an appointment that is the representative of another committee for which they're already serving, you know, uh, if, in terms of coming back then, they're not being, I mean, they're already serving in the capacity, in, right. in her case, as historical commission. Right. So I'm not really sure um, whether we, I mean, it makes it complicated. Let's say we didn't approve it. Who would it go back to, the historical commission, to send us another name? I mean, I think actually the mayor does choose the, the person from the historical commission. Yeah, I don't know. I, I assumed it went, the mayor probably requested that the historical commission come up with a recommendation right. from the mayor. And so this is coming to us from the mayor. Right, right, right. Uh, right. Okay, okay. But he probably what I'm saying is, I wouldn't want to override the will of the historical commission. I, I'll have right. it be have it be a setup for that. Not that it's ever happened, right. and imagine that it ever would happen. It just confuses me when we have these that come as already required from that other board. But and I, I just wanted to point no, that out that it's sometimes it's a little safely clear. Assume that the historic commission is on board with. Oh yeah, that's that's my assumption. That's what I'm saying is that if they are on board with it and we weren't, it would be like if for some not that we have we have on occasion rejected a, a, a candidate, mm -hmm. but it would be kind of awkward to go back for it to go back. It would be like asking the historical commission to send us another. Send us someone else. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I didn't I'm need to, I didn't need to make it more happens. complicated. I just wanted to say that uh, yes. So we do have the motion and seconded. Um, on the floor, and I'll ask all those in favor. Aye. 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 Everybody's in favor, no abstentions or uh, oppositions, so that motion carries. And I think the only thing that we have, uh, we do not have a, a uh, presentation, a departmental presentation set up for March. Um, it's going to be again on the 4th, right? March 4th, because it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's going out of leap year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any ideas, folks? Or do you, uh, anything that you're kind of, yes? Yeah, I had the idea of uh, maybe bringing in somebody from Human Resources just to talk about, you know, um, our hiring practices and where we stand in terms of, you know, um, you know, Chief Nichols mentioned, you know, family leave. You know, what is it? What are all of the initiatives that that we've taken advantage of, and what do they see coming down the pike in terms of the city taking on? That's a great idea. I don't think it's listed as one of the departments I that we are, but I don't think that there's any. I don't think that there'd be any objection. I think what we do is we send the request to the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. So unless we get some sort of question back about whether you know, they think it's appropriate for us to meet with you. Sure. But uh, I'm happy to, if yeah, that's okay, okay. Yeah, we good to have Sue Stone here. Or someone else. Somebody on the list. Yeah. 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 But it's a department. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so should we try for try for that for lunch? Sure. Yes. And then just as a backup, any other, just in case that mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, we've seen fireplace. We haven't seen Lou Hasbrook in a while. If we wanted to I see them. The building commission. I'd like to see Louis Hasbrook again. So He's maybe as a, good. maybe <laughs> as a backup. Okay. So if 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 we can't get um, then we'll try Lou, and then maybe we can ask him for April if um, Sue Stone does come. And how about the senior center too? We should get an upgrade on that. Okay. Because yeah, I we can put are so busy down there. Mm. You folks like that for yep. the lineup? Yep, sounds good. How about, um, that'd be great. I mean, so we, what we do is find out first, but from Sue Stone, and then if she can't, then maybe we'll, and we'll figure out, over. so it yeah. looks like we could have a possibility for the next few months. Great. Okay. All right, is there any other business? Yes, yes. so the barge, we were just mentioning that the um, 
meeting in September is normally scheduled for Labor Day. Do you want to? Or well, we usually do it the Tuesday when we have a Monday holiday. I think we try we to did. do it on the. But last year was headed. Um, let's say the matters meet on September 10th. Well, yeah. Year. So this year they're meeting September 9th. We met at four before the same day. Oh. Day, but oh yeah. Four, okay. Yeah. Five. I mean, we just limit it to an hour. We'll have to yeah. make a decision yeah. now, but just. Okay, so for future okay. thoughts, so we second. may be meeting on the second, the second Monday of September instead of the right. first. Because City Hall is closed on the second. Mm -hmm. My on the second of September. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, September second. Oh, really? City holiday. I like it. Oh, and and, and it's also holiday. is that is that Labor Day? Yeah, yeah the ninth is the second is yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's mm -hmm. going to be the first Monday. That's on. Labor Day. Yeah, first. Monday, uh, <clears throat> oh, is there a motion? Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.